This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 197 is brought to you by the advanced research and technical information available in the Tech Talk section of the Telos website. Visit telos-systems.com, click on support, and then Tech Talk. Tech reviews of our favorite internet routers, an explosive book you'll want to read, and we begin our long-awaited journey into on-air telephony. Andrew Zarian joins me, Kirk Arnack, setting the stage for putting experts and listeners on your station or on your podcast. Hey, welcome in. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. I'm glad you're along. I'm glad I'm here. 197th episode. I think I've been here for 195 of them. Chris Tobin and the other guys uh, took over for me on a, on a few episodes. This is the show where we talk about radio technology and all the stuff that broadcast engineers end up having to do, mostly radio engineers. Occasionally, we talk about some TV issues, uh, too. Our show is, uh, oh, by the way, I'm Kirk Harnack. Yeah, I started the show and uh, here most every time. Our show is brought to you by not a product, but a learning page. I want you to check out at your convenience, not right now, the show's on right now, but when the show's over, check out um, telos-systems.com. Just go there. Click on the support button in the top menu. It'll drop down. Actually, just hover over it. It'll drop down and click on Tech Talk. Tech Talk. If you want to go there directly, here it is. Telos-systems.com slash support slash tech talk. So it's telos-systems.com slash support slash tech dash talk. Anyway, what I want you to find there is really cool. We'll talk about it more during the uh, during the actual break, but it's uh, learning stuff you need to know for now. This for, you know, now's technology, not not 20 years ago technology. All right. Hey, Andrew Zarian has joined us here for this episode because Andrew and I have a very specific purpose in mind for this show. We're going to be talking about the role of listener callers in podcasts. Andrew, welcome in. Hey, Kirk. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm here every week, but I'm never on the show. I, well, you you usually you're pushing the buttons, and you know we don't let you put the camera on you. But today we thought we'd you know get some genuine handsomeness on the show and have you point the camera at you. Barely pushing the buttons, Kirk. There are times <laughs> that I that I don't push anything. <laughs> Just a still picture of the Tello logo. <laughs> hey, you know I was uh, I was in the, in the city in New York City this this week. Were you really? I was. I, I was. I, I had no moment to even call or even think about coming over to Queens. Um, but uh, Joe Talbot, who's been a guest on the show, he works for Telos. He's a telephony guru. Uh, and, I, and I was at his l- secret lair in uh, near Area 51 last week, as you may recall. On Very told the show. Red Room. The Red Room. Yes, that was a Red Room. Yes, indeed. Um, um, so the, Joe and I were in New York City at... Um, I, it's okay to say at, at ABC news, um, and in the studio that's known as TV three. And this is where the, this is the studio that is the control room and production studio for, uh, ABC nightly news with Diane Sawyer. They, uh, they tape other things there as well. Uh, Barbara Walters was in, uh, taping some things for 2020 and, uh, nice. while we were there and we were there to put in some new telephone gear for, uh, eyewitness uh, accounts of uh, breaking news and for reporters and correspondents to call in if they didn't have a camera and a truck set up yet uh, they can call in on their phone and get you know live breaking news and of course everybody does this every I mean all TV local TV stations radio stations networks th- th- they all do this um, and um, uh, an- another network um, that starts with the C and, and uh, lives in Atlanta uh, has already done this with some uh, voice over IP technology. So a- a- ABC now is on the same bandwagon. They're uh, 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 going to be able to put calls on the air that will be as clear as a phone call can possibly be, unhampered by twisted pairs of wires carrying varying analog voltages and currents like Alexander Graham Bell did over 100 years ago <laughs> actually have digital quality from end to end. What did you guys, uh, what did you put in? We put in a Telos VX. Very nice. And uh, it was a, a bit complicated, uh, mostly be- because, you know, ABC is part of Disney. And Disney has, uh, you know, it's the happiest place in the world. And uh, they have um, um, a huge IT department. And that handles all their voice over IP, all all their telephony, all their uh, all their infrastructure for you know 
Ethernet and IP and telephony and computers and all that stuff. So uh, we, we had to work with them. Not saying it was difficult. There was just a lot to be done to get things wrangled and arranged. And they, they have some pretty interesting needs for getting large numbers of reporters on the air. And also they have producers all across the country who need to dial in and listen in real time to uh, breaking news and production that may not be on satellite yet. You know, it, it may not be broadcasting yet, but producers need to hear it prior to it going on air. So, anyway, there's some interesting needs there, and uh, uh, just a pleasure. To, we worked with uh, some engineers, uh, audio engineers mostly, um, at the ABC facility, uh, ABC News in New York, and oh my goodness, these guys are professionals. Holy cow, they know their stuff, uh, and it's just a real pleasure to work with those guys. When you so go from that, a when you go from like a small market setup to a you know larger market setup, is is it is there a drastic difference in, you know, the way that you do things? You know, uh, that's that's a great question, and uh, I, to me, the biggest difference is in network news. And I know things go wrong all the time, but in network news, you really have to ha you you have the budget to try to make sure that nothing goes wrong. That if there's a need. If the producer needs to get somebody on the air from West Undershirt, Arkansas, or Timbuk3, they can get them on the air. And it's not going to be a big hassle, and stuff just works. Stuff just works. And, you know, not everything in their shop was brand new. Um, their, their, uh, their audio console looked older than it was. Uh, they said it was only about five or six years old, but uh, uh, they still have big patch bays in the, in the audio wow. room. Uh, the audio room is not audio over IP yet. Uh, it probably will be at some point. Uh, um, uh, what else is different? Well, you know, I, we've mentioned I do weather at a, the Fox affiliate here in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm f a little bit familiar with their control room and the, the, you know, all the equipment racks in the back and all the ingest systems and the master control systems. And what's the difference? Um, it, there's more backup at a network. You know, there's more stuff that could go wrong and you can still be on the air. And there's probably more pressure to get it get it done right. Not that local news, you know, doesn't care. Uh, they, they certainly do, but they also are probably more limited by budget that says, look, we have enough money to buy one and it just needs to work. Um, whereas uh, at network level, you've, you've got probably more redundancy systems and you have more people dedicated to doing something. Um, you know, there's, there's one guy dedicated to camera shading uh, during a newscast. So he's the guy that makes sure that the camera, the blacks are right, the whites are right, the color balance is right, and he's always just just touching. I mean, he's got a great eye to see what the picture looks like and terrific monitors. Uh, so, um, you know, there's one guy that dedicated to that. Well, at the station where I work at, they do that before the newscast, and then they don't, they don't touch it again during the newscast. They, they assume that the color doesn't change. So that, that's one difference. That's, that's interesting to get different perspectives of, you know, what it's like in, in different markets. Yeah, yeah. I, I did find at ABC News, they use a lot of the same tools that say, you know, market number 30 or maybe market 28 now, uh, Nashville uses at, at a Fox affiliate. Um, the production of a newscast is mostly automated. Uh, they happen to use a system there called Ross Automation. It's a company out of Toronto. We happen to have the exact same automation uh, at Fox 17 in, in Nashville. And it's like a radio station playlist, but it's news. And instead of, you know, it's got more to think about. Instead of just playing a song, playing a song, playing a liner, playing a commercial, playing a song, when, and being able to break in with a live mic, uh, you know, you've got cameras and teleprompter scripts to worry about, and all that's got to coordinate. And then uh, you've got, uh, all different kinds of shots that you can you can go to you know, a, a double box two shot and a, uh, the camera can robotically move out and give you a over the shoulder shot with a the graphic. Um, there's plenty of times when the, a story will start out on the anchor or a reporter and then they'll cut away to full screen video and after that it's a uh, it, it's a VO you know it's a, uh, a voiceover and so the camera is not needed on the anchor or reporter again. Uh, and it happens with weather too. You know, we may start out on me with a full radar image, and then and then cut to uh, just a full screen image of the radar, the forecast, whatever it may be. So, uh, all that can get automated. Um, they have a they had a different brand of automation at the ABC owned and operated affiliate right there, Channel Seven in New York. I forget what the brand was. Um, I want to say Ignite, but that may be wrong. Uh, but they anyway they use the Ross automation uh, in in the. Uh, ABC Nightly News. So, and, and there's plenty of times when they have breaking news and it gets more complicated than they have programmed the Ross automation to do at that moment. And so they'll, they'll take over manual control. They can just jump right into manual and go back to the way they always did it with more people uh, and, and take manual control. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I was, you know, luckily, I'd, 
I've done some TV, so I'm kind of familiar with the setup. If you, if folks will go to my Facebook page, I've posted a couple of pictures. I purposely made the pictures not detailed enough to where you could just read, you know, especially a phone number or something like that. So don't go, you know, looking for secrets. Uh, but uh, if if you go to uh, if you look up Kirk Harnack on Facebook and go to my Facebook page, you'll see uh, I've posted over the last couple of days a few pictures, um, panoramic shots of the audio control room and then the production control room. Uh, and it's it's just amazing just how people come together and just do their jobs, bam, 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 uh, to get a a newscast out the door and. The telephony part, you know, that's really mostly for breaking news. When, when when they can't roll a truck, they can't get a camera there. It's something that you got to describe by phone because that's almost everywhere. And uh, and so that's what we were doing there. All right. Uh, let's, hey, I was going to have just a minute of, of show and tell. And then uh, we're going to um, start our subject about uh, uh, telephony. So I've so I, I got a couple things I've got to get off the desk here and I won't have them avail available later. Um I think I showed one of these earlier. This is one of these Microtech router board routers. A while ago. In, yeah. Yeah. They have them in different flavors and such. And uh, this is one that I bought to go at my radio stations in uh, Mississippi. And why can't I open this? Oh, because is it is the flap sealed shut or do I just not know what I'm doing? Oh, here it is. It's on the end. Okay. Duh. Um, I, I've already programmed one of these for... Uh, one of my radio stations in Mississippi, and now I've got to put one at another one. We're replacing a sonic wall router with this. And these things are just amazingly small, uh, but amazingly powerful. They're uh, a little over $100, 110 120 150 somewhere in there, depending on where you buy it. Uh, our previous guest we had on the show, Dave Anderson, if you go roll back in our list of uh, episodes and look for Dave Anderson, uh, his company, Fabcorp, is a, uh, is a representative of uh, Microtech uh, router board, routers made by Microtech, or as they say in Latvia, Mikrotik. Um, this one has um, – I'm not selling these. I'm just I'm just pointing out these that these are so cool. This is like hundred ten dollars, and the build quality is phenomenal on those. It, it, it is the one thing I don't like is the fact that it uses a wall wart and a Ooh. cannon plug. Um, they uh, let's see. I'm going to take caution to. Uh, oh yeah, they give you they give you a little place here where you can run the wire through the cannon plug. Um, I mean, you know, run, uh, strain relief, if you will, the cable, so it's not likely to pull out. There we go. Not likely to pull out of there, so you can strain relief it. Um, that, you know, that's, but you know, what are you going to do with a box of small? You can't fit a power supply in here. Not easily. Uh, it does have a, a touch screen right here. It's a color LCD touch screen that what I like about this is this will hang on the wall. Okay. Normally I'd rack mount this kind of stuff, but in this case, it's not convenient to hang it on the wall. If there's a problem and we get a call from the general manager, of the radio station, there's no engineer there. I'm the engineer. I'm a seven hour drive away. He can look at this screen and tell it and say, was, is there any graph showing on the screen? Is there throughput? I mean, I'll show him what the normal screen looks like and it'll just display there right near his desk and he can see if it's working or not. Of course, this one has Wi-Fi built in. Uh, you can get them with or without Wi-Fi. I guess what, what I, there's a learning curve. I mean, it, to, for me, it's been steep. A steep learning curve. I've really had to buckle down, watch YouTube videos, read forums to try to understand how to program this guy. Um, but once you get it, then you, you, your brain's kind of in that world. It's no harder than learning Cisco. Um, in fact, it's easier. That's uh, it's it, you can do it command line, but there's also uh, some pretty reasonable web GUIs. You can use an application called uh, WinBox to uh, to control it. WinBox is, is a Windows app. But the web interface is getting better and better, and now you can do just about anything with web interface that you can with WinBox, and uh, you can use any browser for that. It doesn't matter what OS you're on. So then I was, I'm, so I'm visiting uh, Joe Talbot last week at uh, his secret lair just west of or just outside of Area 51, and I saw he had a few of these. Joe, is that the same thing as this? He said, "Yeah, essentially, it doesn't have Wi-Fi and it has fewer ports." But these are all gig ports right here. Oh, nice. This thing's like 59 bucks. Wow, that, that's actually really good. Yeah, it's cheap. And if you uh, open the, uh, the interface to this, Winbox talks to it, it's the same. It's, it has, except for the Wi-Fi and except for the extra five ports, it has the same features. It'll do all kinds of VPN. Um, uh, there's stuff it'll do that I don't know how to do yet. Of course, you can you know, set up your port forwarding and all that kind of jazz. And by the way, it, it, you know, if you're accustomed to setting up port forwarding or QoS, uh, packet priority, if you will, on a home router, some kind of Linksys or a D-Link or a TP-Link or an Apple router, this is tougher. This, this is not just 
you know, enter a couple numbers and click, click, and you're done. Uh, there are a number of things to be entered, but that makes it incredibly more flexible. And 59 bucks. So, anyway, thought that was pretty cool. Tobin's not in yet, is he? No. Okay. So, the next thing I got to show you. I like the show and tell segment. <laughs> what else do you have there? I got a book. Tobin loaned me this book, Exploding the Phone. And it is about phone freaking from the early days of when that started. And it's about one man's adventure. It's written by Phil Lapsley. And I've only gotten through one and a half chapters. Read, read some on the plane to New York and some on the way back. And so far, it is just, uh, let's see, Phil Lapsley co-founded two high school technology companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, two, sorry, two high technology companies. Um, and he advises Fortune 100 companies. It basically, you know, it, this was back, you know, well before the days of IT. There's a map of the U.S. and the various uh, transmission routes that the Bell system ha had, may still have some of this in place. Um, uh, fiber, copper, and microwave, all shown there. But the, the book is about his adventure through finding out how to make free phone calls, uh, find out, and, and it wasn't his purpose to rip off phone company. Uh, at least not in the first two chapters anyway. This is all I'm through. It was his purpose to, to find out about how this stuff works. He was just, just became extremely interested in secret exchanges and inward toll operators. These are operators that help other operators. And, um, and you know, he explains how he would find out um, the secret phone numbers, which aren't even formatted like our like normal phone numbers. Um, secret phone numbers for inward toll operators. And if you call them and you act like you're with the phone company, um, you can get them to do things like, uh, yes, I need you to forward this call. This is going to uh, Dubovnik, uh, Russia. The number is, and they'll forward your call, and there's no billing. Huh, that is very interesting. It's very interesting indeed. And, and uh, well, one of the things that we're finding out was that uh, most of these inward operators, it took a... Touch tone, but not our standard DTMF touch tone that we're used to. It took extra buttons and different tones to uh, make to control the phone network to get to most inward operators. Well, a few switches were improperly programmed, or they never bothered to restrict them, and you could get to them by with an ordinary phone. You could get to an inward operator. So there was a famous famous uh, uh, inward uh, toll center in um, British Columbia, Canada. And the name of the town or the name of the toll center was called Kleena Clean. Weird. Odd name. Kleena Clean. And uh, you, you got to read about it. So exploding the phone, Phil Lapsley. Uh, I got to give this copy back to, uh, back to Joe. Oh, I'll read you something from the back here. Let's see. It's the definitive account of the first generation of network hackers. Uh, at turns, a technological love story, a countercultural history, and a generation-spanning epic. Exploding the phone is obsessively researched and told with wit and clarity. And, you know, I'm not a big book reader. I'm enjoying the heck out of this book. So, highly recommend at least the first two chapters because that's what I've read so far. <laughs> And uh, finally, I wanted to mention something. I think I showed this on a previous uh, show. This uh, Samsung Chromebook. I'm still loving this thing. Now, you know, the company I work for, Telos, and my, I was in the Gmail world very much several years ago. I got off of Microsoft Outlook, just got sick and tired of the weight of Outlook and the huge PST file and it, the PST file always breaking and needing repair. And then having all that on one computer and going to another computer and having nothing. You know, having nothing of the history that I needed, having not, not, none of that. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to bite the bullet. And I was so used to, so used to the Outlook interface. And I was fast with it, right? Bam, 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 bam. And I could find stuff and do stuff real fast with it. Um, copy, paste, and, and, and forward to the right people and reply all or, or not all. And, and I was really used to it. And I'm thinking, how am I ever going to use a web interface like Gmail to and, and come anywhere near the productivity that I get with Outlook? Well, I got to tell you, <laughs> it didn't take long, and I haven't looked back at, at all. And yes, I know Gmail, Google reads all my emails. I get that, you know. I'm, uh, but they give me something in return, and that is ads that mean something to me. So I, um, I made the switch from Outlook to Gmail a couple of years ago exclusively. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I hated Gmail. I was all about having Outlook, uh, and because I was a power user in that sense, I had many different email accounts. 
and I stopped. I totally abandoned Outlook when I had the computer corrupt, uh, the hard drive corrupted. It was a raid, and I lost the PST file. I had no backup of it, and I lost almost every single email that I had for like five, six years. And after that, I totally abandoned it. I went cloud-based exclusively, and I haven't installed Outlook since then. Interesting. In the chat room, Alex Hartman. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. He's talking. He's talking about the uh, the video feed. Okay. Yes. You know, people have to pay for their bandwidth, and so there's an ad you see before you get the video feed on uh, on GFQ. But that's no different than so many other things. So, you know. Oh, Daily Motion was supposed to. Oh, yeah. That's you saying Daily Motion was supposed to fix that. Well. Clear, clean. Oh, oh, Bob Holowenko uh, reports. Yes, clean a clean British Columbia. He's familiar with it. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I just got to say again, I'm, I'm loving this thing. No, this isn't my daily computing machine. This is my second screen when I'm watching TV or I need to take a few minutes upstairs with the family, but I need, I need to answer an email or just check in what the latest is. Um, so this, you know, my daily work machine is, a, is now a MacBook Pro uh, with the Retina screen, and it has enough power to do the video editing and such that I need to do. Uh, right now, I'm on the Windows machine because this I got a real powerful Windows machine that you know, I can't take with me. It's a big honking uh, uh, under the desk uh, desktop machine and so that's what's doing my, the uh, the Skype for us here but love this thing and you, you know what <laughs> that ad that Microsoft ad where the girl brings one of these into the pawn shop the what is it is, the, is it the pawn stars guy yeah that, yeah yeah do that ad? and they explained to her that this is worthless you know it's it, it, it it's not a real computer it doesn't have outlook and word and you know of course they're telling half the story um, the part they're leaving out is the good part. <laughs> I find it amazing it, that they're even acknowledging it. Microsoft is acknowledging this device. That's a good point. That's a good point. They're pointing it out. Of course, they're pointing out you know it's perceived negative uh, things. But you know what? This doesn't have a virus. And you could confidently give this to the least technologically savvy executive in your building, <laughs> and, and he's not going to get a virus on it. Because it's, you know, well, anyway... Never say never, but <laughs> I like it. All righty. So let's chat. Uh, let's move our subject to uh, telephony. Our show is being brought to you by telos-systems.com. And in a moment, we'll talk about the uh, Tech Talk part of the Telos website. Lots of valuable information there that you can educate yourself quickly and easily about what's happening, uh, what the latest technologies are and how to use them, and maybe how to get around the perceived problems that, that they have. Um, so, Andrew, we're going to talk about uh, – putting callers on podcasts. Yes. And most podcasters don't do that. Don't they, put callers on. And I've always thought that the reason was because, hey, I'm a low-budget podcaster. Um, I don't have the money for a Telos or Comrex or even a JK Audio phone system. And if I did, even if I did, I need an audio console and, and mix minus and all kinds of things that, that are kind of normal for broadcasters, but not at all normal for podcasters. So most podcasters don't do not do this. Tell me your thoughts about if that's changing and, and how... Of course, let me back up and say one more thing it's to set this up. Broadcasters put callers on the air to involve the audience in hopefully a, a more meaningful way than just a one-way broadcast. They hear back from the audience, uh, sometimes just as a, as a, a prompt, a, a prompting ruse, as, uh, as Rush, Rush Limbaugh might, uh, might describe it. Uh, you know, when people take requests, you know, they're not really trying to figure out what song to play. <laughs> they're just trying to involve the caller in a song they were going to play anyway. Um, uh, and, and then there's news talk shows where, you know, we probably really are interested in what a caller has to say as long as it's brief and salient. So, um, podcasts, how could, uh, how, how come podcasts haven't and where do you think that ought to change? So a lot changing. I th 2014 is going to be a really interesting year for podcasts because there's a lot of things changing as far as ad revenue and quality. I think, I think as podcasters, we're learning what good audio is. I think we're getting used to hearing, higher quality audio coming out. So a lot of people are improving their setups. And one thing that people have been battling, uh, and, and this is something that we've, we've been battling, is incorporating callers into our show. Uh, traditionally, the only real way for a podcaster to, to do it is Skype or to do uh, you know some sort of SIP client where people could call in. But with Skype, for example, I can't really screen who's calling unless I know the username. Uh, I can't accept more than one phone call at a time. Uh, the, obviously, there's some hacks to that, but traditionally, you can't. 
So you, 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 with Skype, you really can't put people on hold and have them in a holding queue. That, that you've screened some, you've not screened some, and they're waiting to when it's their turn to to be put on the air. Yeah, I mean, I've done hack setups where I've had uh, the same instance of Skype running on four different machines, and I'm potting somebody down on the board, and I bring them up when they're ready, so I'm able to kind of have four four lines technically, but it's still a really you know. I'm rigging the entire thing. It's not a proper way of doing it. Uh, yeah. Now we have options like Blog Talk Radio, for example, which I use for a couple of weeks to learn the system a little bit because I've heard such great stuff about it. Uh, the interface is phenomenal. Uh, I think it's 40 bucks a month, and you're getting uh, two hours a day for your show. or two. It, it, it's depending on whatever the, the pricing is, but... There are a lot of issues with that. Yeah, the interface is great. Yeah, you're able to get a call screener, which helps tremendously when getting calls and they're able to give you notes, but the system is kind of broken. And there's mm -hmm. latency. Uh, at times, a caller can't hear you. At times, uh, it's it's almost like it's oversold as a product. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, in fact, we, let, it's worthwhile to to mention different ways to put callers on the air. You know, back in back in the earlier days of uh, telephony, uh, when well uh, on the radio anyway. Let's say when uh, Telos's founder Steve Church, he was a talk show host and an engineer, and he wanted to put callers on the air and have it sound better than taking a speakerphone and pointing a microphone at the speakerphone, and that was the interface between the caller and the audio console. And and there were other ways to do it too. There were telephone hybrids, and they just weren't very good. And the the problem traditionally with the the technical problem has been when, to interface a two wire telephone line, two wires carrying both sides of the conversation simultaneously. And uh, the technology to do that is very imperfect, and you you don't get you don't get perfect. You don't even get very good separation between the received audio from the caller and the send audio that you're sending to the caller. This is, you know, pick up an old-fashioned POTS phone, talk in it, and uh, there's a certain amount of built-in side tones. You can tell how loud to talk. You talk in the microphone on the handset, and you hear yourself in the earpiece, and you kind of get to judge if you're talking too loud or not based on your own voice. And actually, that was just kind of a happy coincidence of the way it works. A little bit of side tone could be added or taken away, but for the most part, it's a happy, uh, happy coincidence. But when you're putting callers on the radio... You don't want any side tone at all. What you send to the caller, typically, of course, the, the announcer's voice or other participants in, in, the, uh, in the conversation uh, or other phone callers, you want to send that to the caller, and you don't want any of that back. No, you from want none caller, of it. Yeah. Yeah, from the caller, you just want to hear the caller. Because if you send audio to the caller, and it goes through the phone system and gets its phase all wrapped around and gets some delay in there and comes back, even if it's not delayed enough to be an echo, a, a slap echo delay, it'll be out of phase. And when you mix that return, the, the send audio that you send to the caller, when you when it comes back, uh, as it does with any average or poor hybrid system, and you pot that up on the console and you mix it with the original of the voices that made that send, in other words, the, the disc jockey, the announcer, uh, his cohorts, you mix that together and you get the phase cancellation, and it sounds just terrible. And if, you, and if any of you are old enough, like me, <laughs> to have worked at a station that had a, a crappy phone hybrid, you know that whenever you would, like you'd be on the air, you'd, you'd have your, your microphone turned up. And when you turn up the phone line, your voice would change. It would go like this. Yes, caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. And you would end up sounding like a telephone line. Not because it was all telephone line, but because it was coming back and it would naturally be time delayed out of phase with the audio that you were sending. Bottom line was it didn't sound good. Now, in fact, I worked at stations that had bad telephone hybrids. As Actually, a lot of this was before Steve Church even invented the DSP-based telephone hybrid. And what we would do was, you know, like we would do Tradio or Swap Shop or, you know, uh, that, that kind of show. If I was talking, I would keep the caller turned down manually. I'd keep my hand on the, on the caller's fader. And when it was time for the caller to talk, I'd shut up and turn the caller up. And uh, so I was manually jockeying the whole thing so that it didn't sound too bad on the air. Uh, well, Steve Church got tired of that. And so he invented the... DSP, digital signal processing, based or enhanced telephone hybrid, which uh, uh, basically it looks at the audio being sent to the caller. And then when audio comes back from the caller, any audio that looks the same as what was sent gets canceled out. Any audio that's new to the equation, well, that would be the caller's 
audio, what he said, uh, that wouldn't get canceled out. And it worked amazingly well. Nobody had ever done anything like it. And it just improved the quality of phone calls on the air. This was 30 years ago that Steve invented this. Uh, it improved the, the quality of the callers tremendously. Now, here are the problems. The box was expensive. or Not expensive for a radio station, for a big going business, but expensive for a podcaster today. A minimum of $700, $800, $900, $1,000 for, for a hybrid. Uh, and it was only one hybrid. So if you wanted to stack up some callers, then we had to invent multi-line phone systems. So without getting into, I guess, enormous detail here, um, uh, a multi-line phone system to properly queue up callers and put them on the air, that's going to cost at least a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and and e easily you can spend seven or $8,000 on, on such a system uh, where you have callers ready to, ready to go one after another and they're screened or not. But they're not all getting busy signals. You know, some people can get in. Um, what was the point? Oh, yeah. And, you know, here we are in the age of computers. We're almost past, we're almost in the post-PC era now, right? And a lot of folks have asked, why can't you just build a multi-line phone system, VoIP-based, in a PC? Why can't I just run a piece of software that is a phone system in your PC? And a few companies have tried that. Um, and inevitably, <clears throat> it comes down to the lack of a real-time operating system. And Windows, OS X, even Linux, uh, standard Linux, can't handle the DSP functionality fast enough to make the, the, the system sound good. It's just got to be done in dedicated hardware at this point. Um, there, are, there are a few cloud-based talk show systems. Um, one of them is what you mentioned, Andrew, and that's Blog Talk Radio, and I'm going to ask you about that in, in a minute. Uh, there's another one called Call-In Studio. Uh, a guy named Sean Salisbury uh, put that together, and it's pretty cool. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a permanent cost and a, and a per month cost to to make it run, but it's kind of on demand. Um, it the the quality is pretty good. It's not as good as doing your own phone lines, but it's 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 it, it's all right. And uh, uh, and you get a, a web interface to to control it to you know screen your calls and put your callers on the air, or drop them or whatever. So I think there's a, a future in that kind of model. And uh, um, but I wanted to explain to folks the point I was really trying to get at is why don't we just why doesn't Telos or Comrex or somebody just make an app that runs on a PC, brings your uh, SIP your VoIP phone circuits in, and lets you do a whole talk show on, on your PC? Uh, all that's doable, but when you get down to the DSP of the uh, of the phone lines, it gets tough, and the performance is is pretty lacking still at, at this point. Uh, hey, maybe a plug-in PCI card. Uh, PCI e card would uh, um, no PCI Express yeah PCI Express card would uh, help in that regard but that just hasn't been the motive. you know that's going to cost plenty of money too you might as well buy an outboard system so Andrew I'm sorry I've been yapping yes. here just no to set I'm, this, I'm, I'm set learning this up and, you know give the give give the different de, you know delineations of systems you know there's single hybrid systems single phone line single hybrid you might use that in a production room or for a talk show you just want to interview one person if you just want to do an interview with somebody by phone. Single phone line, single telos telephone hybrid, and hook it to your audio console or your computer, and and fine, it'll work, and you get the best audio quality that you can. Um, a multi line phone system, you know, we have those. Uh, you know, telos does, and others too that do pots. Uh, telos has the ISDN type systems that uh, really got the quality better over pots, and now we have uh, voice over IP systems. Comrex has one, telos has uh, one, and um, uh, soon to be more, and and so. Uh, then so the next thing is cloud-based or PC-based systems. So now, Andrew, um, Blog Talk Radio, tell us what that is and and how it's supposed to work. So technically, Blog Talk Radio is a uh, it's a network of radio shows, and the w the reason why they got so popular is because anybody could, you could pretty much host a radio show with your phone. That that was the purpose of it. So anybody could call in and you could host it, just walk around and do a show. As more people started using it, more uh, traditional broadcasters started putting their show on there, and they started expanding beyond that. But they have a call-in system. They also have a um, a switchboard and a and a virtual soundboard where you could you know pot uh, up uh, different sound effects and bumpers and stuff like that. But I haven't really used that side. But I did use their phone call system, and the interface is really pretty. I mean, it's a really easy to learn, uh, pretty interface. So uh, I've used it with Skype. So I dial out with Skype to their number. Uh, it tells okay. me, hey, your show's about to start in 25 minutes. Uh, I 
I stay on hold when the show's ready. It goes live, and the phone number's live, and anybody could call in to that dedicated phone number. I've used it with a screener, so they pick up. They stay, you know, um, uh, who's calling? What are you doing? What do you want to talk about? They write it down for me, and I'm able to just click on answer call, and they're live on the air. I could also put them on hold. I could send them back to the screener. So it actually works like a phone screening, like a legitimate, you know, call-in system. The downside has been for me, depending on what time you're doing the show, there are awful, awful uh, delays. I, I mean, the latency gets really crazy, maybe three, four seconds at times. Mm. And it's virtually impossible to have a conversation at that point when you're that delayed. Uh, yes, the, yes. The, the the quality of the call drops. So at times they're crystal clear. At times it's, it's absolutely awful. Uh, you can't even understand what they're saying. So the inconsistency... For someone like me uh, that wants to do a call-in system on a regular basis, a call-in show, uh, it's it's not very dependable. And if people can't, if you can't hear the caller, what's the point of taking a phone call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't used the other system, but for a lot of people, I know I know some people that have built these crazy, um, at home, they built these setups where they're doing magic jacks, and they have like four or five magic jacks, and they have the number forwarding to another number that's a Skype number. Uh, they, they, I've, I've seen some crazy setups, but the amount of effort that people are putting in right now, I think mm -hmm. we're at a point in 2014 where things that Telos is offering, you know, like the, the phone systems that you guys are offering or, or any other company, it's becoming a reality where you're saying, okay, you know what? I, I'm willing to invest this much money. I'm, I could get a hundred dollar, you know, SIP box and just convert those SIP lines that are dirt cheap to POTS lines. And just plug it in there. And it's a one-time investment for the product. And now I know I could take six phone calls. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And you just mentioned a, a really good thing. One of the things that scares people about the cost of doing talk shows, and it's been a, pay, a thorn in the side and just an accepted expense for radio stations, is the high monthly cost of individual phone lines from the traditional telco. So, uh, you know, POTS lines, uh, business POTS lines, anywhere from $50 to $100 per month per line, unless you're, you know, buying some kind of DID trunks. Uh, and then you, then you have to really start to know what you're doing. Uh, ISDN uh, uh, used to be cheaper. Now, in many areas, we're getting up to over $200 per ISDN line you know, per month. It's ridiculous. And, and here's uh, voice over IP um, uh, and... And it can be cheap. It can also be just as expensive as POTS. I mean, Vonage is a popular name, but it's a closed system. Uh, and I'm not sure what codec that they're using. It's probably G729, um, uh, which is less quality th than you want. I guess I should spend a second on that, by the way, um, because quality here d does mean uh, at least a little something. Um, you know, the traditional codec, the way we turn analog and then, well, analog to digital, and then digital into a lower bitrate digital, uh, is to uh, the, the phone company standard for decades has been G.711. And that's the traditional phone codec. We all, our brains and our ears know what that sounds like. Um, uh, it may or may not be uh, high pass filter. In other words, it, it may or may not roll off the lows, but the high end is going to be no more than about 3.3 kilohertz worth of audio. And it's a, a 64 kilobit per second uh, codec um, uh, just by using a, uh, and, and, it's, and it's not a psychoacoustic codec. It just does some math, uh, samples at a fairly low range of bits at uh, eight kilohertz of sampling, and you end up with 64 kilobits per second. So it's not, li it's not like MP3. Uh, or AAC, which are psychoacoustic codecs. It's just a plain math codec. It's fast. It's effective. We know what it sounds like, and, and, and it's okay. Um, in the earlier days of internet telephony, um, uh, a, a number of voice codecs have been developed, and uh, one of them that became popular was G.729, mostly because it would work at really low bit rates, like six, seven, eight kilobits per second instead of 64 kilobits per second. Uh, G711, you can packetize that and send it over the internet, and it's 64 kilobits per second plus the packet overhead. So you're looking at typically 85 or so kilobits per second. And, you know, now that's pretty easy, but, you know, uh, uh, I think five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, a lot of connections were very challenged by that kind of bit rate. Uh, I ran a whole radio station uh, back uh, 15 years ago, and our connection was 64 kilobits per second. That was it for the whole station. So you, you couldn't even carry one phone call uh, unless it was going to be G729. Um, so 
uh, uh, it, I, I'm not 100% sure of this, but a lot of companies that offer free or cheap telephony services are using G729. And even if you sign up with a reputable company, their default codec may be G729. From what I remember, is, Kirk, uh, Vonage uses three codecs, depending on uh, which setting you're the, using. Yeah, which that's right. You got that slider for different So I think, it's, that's right. I think their their highest one is G.711. Uh, their mid-range was uh, G726, and then their low range is uh, G729. Ah, okay, good. Thanks for that info. Yes, I forgot about that slider, and I, I I did use Vonage for some years, and then decided that you know this costs almost as much as pots. By the time they they get done billing me everything, um, so uh, um, anyway, my point is that if you have a choice about it, you really want to at least do uh, G seven one one. Now you may have heard some talk, and uh, Bob Holowenko m- mentions uh, G seven two two. G seven two two is a a well, newer than G711, it's a codec that can also run at 64 kilobits, but you get seven, a little over seven kilohertz of audio uh, bandwidth through it. And as broadcast engineers, we generally kind of think G722, okay, well, that's our last resort codec for doing a show from somewhere. But compared to normal telephony, it sounds great. Uh, if you see a, a phone, and I have a phone right here, this is uh, uh, a little Polycom phone that uh, Telos shipped me to use as part of the the Telos uh, uh, business phone system. Um, it has HD voice. Uh, HD voice just doesn't isn't isn't any particular codec. It's typically G seven two two or G seven two two dot one or G seven two two dot two. But uh, um, anyway, uh, that phone can speak G seven two two, which gives you a really nice sound over uh, over a handset i digress though my point was this um uh and here's the point i was gonna gonna make i, th- I showed this on a previous show i don't think the wires are quite long enough to no the wires aren't quite long enough to show this. i have a little box here from grandstream and it is called the ht704 from grandstream ht704 and it will connect to most Outside SIP services, not closed ones like Vonage or Manage, uh, Magic Jack, but it'll, you know, to other ones from Vitality or Packet 8 or 8x8 it is now or other such ISPs uh, or uh, you know, telephony providers. And uh, it's an endpoint, so it'll give you four POTS lines outputs. So you're converting SIP to POTS right there in this little box that costs $100, and you can wire those POTS lines to anybody's um, traditional POTS codec. So I've got them wired to a Telos HX6 right here. We're going to go into some depth on a future show and describe how to set that up. Uh, mine's set up with my Raspberry Pi, which is asking, uh, acting as an asterisk box, but uh, or you know, free PBX. Um, uh, but it, it could work with somebody's outside service. So I could actually make that little um, Grandstream box work with, say, some Telos, some extensions off the Telos phone system or some extensions that Joe Talbot has uh, off his asterisk uh, box or directly to a service uh, like uh, Vitality. And so I'd have these incoming and outgoing phone lines, hook them up to a, you know, whether it's a 20-year-old hybrid or a modern hybrid like this HX6, uh, y- you're going to get, you know, inexpensive Telephone calls that can come in. You can build your own hunt group, and it'll you know roll over. So you can. And I could take four callers here, have them on hold. You can easily get a, a an, an eight port box and have eight phone lines. Uh, so anyway, the p- point there is we're going to go into some depth on this and show you how to on a future episode of This Week in Radio Tech. We'll show you the screens, the setup screens, give you some ideas of do you want to hook to you know uh, somebody's business phone system, if you got a friend that's going to supply you some lines, or do you want to hook to a service like Vitality or, or uh, um, uh, Paytech now, Windstream. Uh, and you know anybody that's not proprietary closed, uh, you could uh, have an account and hook up and get your, your telephone service that way. We'll also give you tips on how to set up your router so that you have some packet prioritization so you don't get too much... Uh, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, stuttering of the audio. So that's the idea. That's the whole idea, and that's where we're going to go with that subject. So, Andrew, are you interested in learning about that? I am. I, I have actually, uh, we've spoken off the air a couple times about this, and uh, I, I've been doing some of my homework about, you know, what's involved in doing something like this. And it, and it's really cool. I mean, there's a lot of options, but if you want to do it right, I still think you, 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 you know, get something like the NX or even the VX if, if you want to do, uh, you know, SIP lines. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're technically you're going to lose a little bit of quality in even a, a local uh, ATA analog terminal adapter, and that's what the Grandstream is. By the way, you know those ATAs, 
you can buy them all day long in one and two line versions. Uh, those are the most popular. Uh, if you want to do a, a talk show with multiple lines, I've got a six line talk show system here. Gee, I'd like to have six lines. Turns out I have four lines going into it. Uh, I could add a two line ATA to that and, and you know, fill up all six lines. Uh, to me, that's a really good interim choice if you want, if you're a, a broadcaster or a podcaster, I guess we're talking to a lot of podcasters here, and you're interested in going to to put callers on the air, but you don't want to make that commitment of spending a hundred or two hundred dollars a month on phone lines. Gee, what a wasteful recurring expense. Um, we'll show you how to get hooked up with a with a SIP provider. Get yourself some phone lines. You can point an eight hundred number at those phone lines if you want to, and then um, you you know there are some SIP based phone systems on the market right now. There's the Telus VX, which is kind of big. That may be much bigger than what you want. Uh, the guys at Comrex also have a smaller uh, uh, SIP, uh, SIP capable phone system, the Stack VIP. I've not tried it yet, but it's there. It it works. Uh, some people are are using it, and I think you're going to see some more products from Telos that are going to be SIP based. They're smaller, but even if you don't want to, even if you want to go on eBay and buy a an older or a used multi line phone system, it's probably going to be POTS based. Well, no problem. Use a hundred dollar box to convert your very cheap SIP service into some POTS lines. Plug them in the back of your of your um, uh, phone system, and voila, as they say, you have now a multi line phone system. You have a rollover number. You can have some hotline numbers, and you can put phone callers, listener callers, on your podcast. And that's what we're going to show you how to do. Uh, just want to get you thinking about it now, and we're going to show you how to do that on, on a future episode. I think that's really cool because I'm going to have a lot of questions for you uh, for that episode. I got a feeling it's going to end up being a, a two-parter <laughs> because just the subject of how to buy and order uh, and configure SIP service and then how you get that into your business, your home, uh, through a router, through your standard internet service um, without you know ha having dropouts, without, you know having decent quality on the calls, that deserves some conversation right there. So we're going to have to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about you know, uh, choosing a, a single or multi-line phone system uh, for, for putting callers on the air and how you hook that into your own audio console, uh, what connections have to be made uh, available for that. So plenty to discuss. It's, it's, uh, it's easy for people who have been doing it for a long time, but if you've not, there's, there's a number of things to think about, and we'll help you through all that. So, hey, our show's been brought to you by… Uh, my colleagues at Telos, and uh, instead of talking about a product, I want to mention uh, the uh, the Telos Tech Talk webpage. Telos Systems has redone its uh, 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 overall webpage. Go to telos-systems.com and hover over the support button. Click on Tech Talk, and you'll get the page that Andrew is showing you right now. There's a number of uh, papers, uh, white papers, and, and other how tos uh, on that webpage. The top one, for example, uh, is one that I did about audio reliability over the public internet. How to design robust IP streaming for outside broadcast, STL, and program distribution. Uh, I did another paper on IP audio connection tests. You know, some resources that you can use to uh, see how good your uh, your connection is and if it's good enough to uh, to do IP audio, which would include voice over IP. Um, <laughs> a paper I did about wire in the broadcast plant. Less wire means you're doing it right. <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> and then Joe Talbot uh, chimed in with this paper: voice over IP in the real world. How I Quit Worrying and Learned to Live Without Pots. Yeah, so uh, that, that, that's a good one. Joe gave that paper at NAB a couple of years ago, and it's really worth the read. You'll find out a lot. Hey, we got to go. I got a, a meeting coming up. Andrew, thank you for joining us. It hey, looks anytime. like Chris Tobin uh, didn't get a connection into us from uh, downtown Manhattan. No, I guess, I guess the 4G wasn't good. <laughs> kind of a short show this week. We're going to have a more expanded show. And, uh, uh, hey, we have a new booker. So we're going to have more guests coming up in coming weeks. Thanks for joining us on this short episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Andrew, thanks for providing questions and comments. I really appreciate you being there. And uh, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>